Okay, everyone, welcome back to Chapter 6. Chapter 6 is the skeletal system, so we're going to start learning about the bones. Chapter 7 and Chapter 8 are going to refer to the two different divisions of the skeleton. So in Chapter 6, we're going to do an introduction to the skeletal system. We're going to talk about bone cells and the histology of bones. And we're also going to talk about different types of bones as well. We're going to discuss fractures and the different types of fractures and, and how bones heal and how bones form uh, and such. So this is going to be um, an introduction to the skeletal system. And then in Chapter 7 and Chapter 8, we're going to actually focus on learning some of the different bones that we find that make up the skeletal system. So the skeletal system is made up of bones, cartilage, and joints. Bone is a type of connective tissue, specifically a type of supportive connective tissue. Supportive connective tissue tends to be very hard and gives our body structures shape. But bone is also a very diverse type of tissue because there are many other types of tissues that make up bones and they can be found within bones. So there's also cartilage that can be found as a part of bone. At the ends of our long bones, we're gonna find, we're gonna find cartilage. Inside of a space inside of our long bones, we're gonna find adipose tissue, which in the skeletal system is referred to as yellow bone marrow. We will also see nervous tissue and epithelial tissue in bones. Epithelial tissue specifically will be found in the blood vessels that are coursing through the bones. So one thing that we will learn is that bone has a very, very rich blood supply. There are lots of blood vessels that are found within our bones. So bones being a very supportive type of connective tissue are going to form the framework of our bodies. They're going to give our body structure shape and also give a surface area for muscles to attach to. When the muscular system and the skeletal system come together, that's where our bodies are finally allowed to produce some type of really useful movement. But those are not the only functions of the skeletal system as we will come to see. The skeletal system will also play a very large role in calcium homeostasis, and it will help to regulate our blood levels of calcium. So just as we see with all of our 11 body systems, bone is no different. Bone is going to be integral to the function of the rest of the body systems to help the entire body's homeostasis function properly. So on this slide, we're going to see the various functions of the muscular system. So some of the more intuitive functions that we see are providing a support system for the body and allowing attachment sites for muscles. Again, muscles will attach to our bones through tendons. And without bones, muscles wouldn't have anything to attach to. Our skeletal muscles would just be existing in our bodies and, and not necessarily able to pivot our bodies around. So muscles and bones together give our bodies a way to move around very freely and smoothly. And that plays into this function in that the skeletal system will assist with body movements with the help of the muscular system. Lots of our body systems have this protective function, and the skeletal system is going to be no different. The skeletal system will form a vault by which the brain can be protected within, in the cranial cavity. So, so the, the bones of the skull are going to protect the brain. The bones of the thoracic cage are going to protect the heart and the lungs. So while the skeletal system has this movement function and a support function, it's also going to serve as a very hard, dense protective layer to some of our organs that are very special and found very deep within the body. As I mentioned on the last slide, the skeletal system is also going to play a major role in mineral homeostasis, namely calcium. Calcium is going to be stored in bone. In fact, bone is our body's major calcium reservoir. If our blood calcium levels drop too much, we're going to break down some of our bone to release calcium into the blood. And when our calcium levels go up, we're going to bring that calcium and add it into our bone. This is the concept of bone remodeling, which we will discuss in later slides. You can also note that bone is a storage site for two special other parts of our bodies, red bone marrow and yellow bone marrow. Yellow bone marrow is adipose tissue, and we find that stored in our long bones. And red bone marrow helps to produce blood cells. That's one of the functions of red bone marrow. And we can find that stored within our bones. So there's a lot of other tissues that help make up our bones, and, and a lot of other tissues that can be found within our bones as well. And each of the structures found within our bones are going to help the bones play their role in our body's homeostasis. So based on bones structure, we have two different types of bones. We have compact bone and we have spongy bone. 
Compact bone often forms this very hard and dense shell that can be found on the outside of our bones. This is a very hard layer that serves protection for the structures that can be found inside of our bones. And we also have spongy bone. Spongy bone is named because it sort of resembles the way a sponge looks. There are these very irregular growths that can be found in here and a lot of space in spongy bone. And we'll often find spongy bone found towards the inside of our bones. Compact bone serves that protective function and spongy bone actually serves to lighten bone and also provide structural support. The bone that we find making up spongy bone can also be called trabeculae. These irregular bone growths that sort of randomly attach to one another in this spongy bone is called trabeculae. So the, so the bone in spongy bone is referred to as trabeculae, and I will mention that again on a later slide. But this is going to be the trend that we will often see with the skeletal system. A very hard and dense protective compact bone layer on the outside of our bones, and then a layer of spongy bone found on the inside that's going to lighten our bones. Bone is a very, very heavy material, and so spongy bone serves to lighten our bones by allowing these spaces to not contain such a heavy material. Each type of bone is going to have their own histological structure, and we will cover these on later slides. So this is just a picture with a few labeled parts of our, of our bones, but the main thing I want you to get from this picture is that we have this very thin layer of compact bone on the outside, and then most of what's found on the inside is going to be spongy bone. I just wanted to provide you guys with a picture for what a real human bone is going to look like, um, and there's a couple other structures on here too, which we will cover on the coming slides. Now one thing I just want to go on record, spongy bone is called spongy bone because of its sponge-like appearance. However, spongy bone is still rather rigid. It does not feel like a sponge, even though it might look like a sponge. So again, spongy bone has a lot of space that can be found within it, and this is actually going to contain red bone marrow. And spongy bone also is going to provide structural support. Because these spicules are, are growing with each other, when, when some type of compression force comes in and, and pushes on the bones, those forces are going to be equally distributed throughout the bone because all of these spicules are, are sort of randomly growing into each other, but that's going to cause the transmission of forces through the bone. So while trabeculae is a lot less dense than our compact bone, the spongy bone trabeculae still do provide a lot of structural support for our long bones. So there are a few classifications to bones. We have long bones, short bones, flat bones, irregular bones, and sesamoid bones. And we will cover these a little bit later. However, there's a very important concept that I need to touch on with one of these types of bones. And those are long bones. Long bones are named because they are longer than they are wide. However, that's not truly what distinguishes long bones from other types. The long bones are going to have all of these structures found within them. And many of the bones found in our, our, our skeleton are going to be considered long bones. So every long bone is going to have a few different parts, and that's going to be based on that long bone structure. So I have a nice picture of this on the next slide, but I just want to go over what some of these structures are and where we can find them. Every long bone is going to have a skinny shaft in the center, and at the ends are going to have two enlarged circular parts. The center shaft is known as the diaphysis, and the two ends that are enlarged are known as the epiphyses. At the ends of each of our long bones, we're also going to have a layer of cartilage, which serves a protective function when two long bones are rubbing past each other. We will also find a long, hollow space that can be found within the diaphysis of our long bones, known as the medullary cavity. And we'll also have some connective tissue that can be found wrapping around the long bones as well as on the inside of our long bones. So there's a lot of structures that we have within our long bones. We'll also find red and yellow bone marrow housed within our bone, and we're going to have some other structures scattered in there as well. So let's take a look at our long bone and understand the different parts and what each part does. So this specific bone is known as the humerus, and we can see the humerus found in this portion of the arm. And now, while we're looking at the humerus, these different regions of our long bone can be applied to all long bones. So we'll also have some long bones in the lower part of the arm as well, and each of these will have the same structures found within them. So let's go over some of these different structures. The long center shaft that is skinny is known as the diaphysis. The diaphysis is the shaft of our long bones, the skinnier portion in the middle that connects the two enlarged ends. 
Now the two enlarged ends are known as epiphyses, and with every long bone we will have a proximal epiphysis, which is more proximal, and we'll have a distal epiphysis, which is more distal and found further down the arm. So the two epiphyses are connected to each other through the diaphysis. And this is a very, very important characteristic of long bones. If we do not have an epiphysis and a diaphysis, we will not consider bones long bones. So again, this, this classification of long bones is special because all of these bones will have these structures found within them. So we have, we have a few major regions. We have a proximal epiphysis, a diaphysis, and a distal epiphysis. Now found between the epiphysis and the diaphysis is an intermediate region known as the metaphysis. So that can be found here, connecting each of the epiphyses with the diaphysis. Within the metaphysis, we have a very, very special structure, and that is known as the epiphyseal line. Now we'll also have an epiphyseal line found at this end of the bone, however we can't see it because we have not taken a section of down here. Um, but one thing that we can see is this epiphyseal line is going to course from either side. The epiphyseal line can also be referred to as the growth plate. So there's some hyaline cartilage that's found in here at the epiphyseal line that will help our bones to elongate as we grow. This is our growth plate. So when we are growing and our bones are getting longer and longer, we're adding bone to this epiphyseal line. So I like to look at the epiphyseal line as the, as the structure that separates the, the epiphysis from the diaphysis. Now, as a reminder, one of the other things that we see with bone is that we have this layer of compact bone found on the outside of, of our long bones, but we'll also have this spongy bone found on the inside. Now, let's zone in on the epiphysis first. The epiphysis is mainly going to be having this spongy bone found within it, these different spongy bone trabeculae here. But there's a few other things that I, that I need to mention about the epiphysis as well. So in the spaces between our spongy bone trabeculae, we will find red bone marrow. This is the substance that's going to contain different types of hematopoietic stem cells that help produce blood cells. So red bone marrow is an extremely important element of bone, and again, that can be found at the distal epiphysis as well. All of the structures found at the proximal epiphysis can also be found at the distal epiphysis as well. Now, our other major structure that can be found at the epiphysis is a layer of articular cartilage. Articular cartilage is going to wrap around the epiphysis of our long bones, and this provides a protective layer to our bones. Long bones are a type of bone that will often articulate with other long bones at their epiphyseal ends. So the implication of that is that the ends of long bones we're going to have a lot of friction between two different long bones. So this articular cartilage is a protective layer that will serve to shield our bone from constantly grinding past another long bone. I should also just take a second to mention that the word articulation refers to a place where two bones have come together to form a joint. And we see that occurring at the ends of our long bones, namely at the epiphysis. So this articular cartilage, which is also hyaline cartilage, is found at the ends wrapping around each epiphysis, and we can see that at the distal epiphysis as well. So this is going to wrap around the epiphysis and protect it from grinding past other long bones. And while we have this articulation, we nicely will call this articular cartilage. So in the epiphysis, we have articular cartilage, this layer of spongy bone found in the center, and in the space between our spongy bone trabeculae, we'll have red bone marrow. And all of that is going to be separated from the diaphysis by the epiphyseal line or our growth plate. Now within the diaphysis, we're going to have a few different structures. We actually do not have an inner layer of spongy bone for most of the diaphysis. Instead, we have this long, hollow cavity known as the medullary cavity. That's the space found within the diaphysis of our long bones. All of our long bones are going to be hollow in the center. And there's certain structures that can be found inside of this medullary cavity. The most notable structure that can be found within the medullary cavity is yellow bone marrow. Yellow bone marrow is stored within the medullary cavity of our long bones. And yellow bone marrow just refers to adipose tissue, so fat. That's going to be found inside of our long bones. We'll also see a lot of vascularity to our bones. There's going to be lots of blood vessels that course through our bones and, and also go through these spaces between the spongy bone trabeculae. And that will also exist in the medullary cavity. 
But more importantly, we also have a layer of connective tissue that can be found lining the medullary cavity, and that is known as the endosteum. This portion of the word osteo refers to bone. So endosteum is a layer of connective tissue on the inner side of our medullary cavity. So specifically, the endosteum can be found between the yellow bone marrow and the bone itself. Now on the outside of our long bones, we will also have another layer of connective tissue. This one is called the periosteum. So endo meaning inside and peri for meaning around. And you can see this layer of connective tissue that's wrapping around our, our long bone on the diaphysis specifically. So the periosteum is just found on the diaphysis. And when it gets up to the epiphysis, it's going to sort of be in the same plane as the articular cartilage. So while, while you can see that you know the articular cartilage isn't necessarily going to be covering the entire epiphysis and, and the periosteum might come up here in real bones, for the purpose of the test, I want you to understand that articular cartilage is found around the epiphysis and the periosteum is going to be found around the outside of the diaphysis. While there are some discrepancies here, on my test, that's how I will ask this question which structure can be found on the outside of the epiphysis, that is going to be our articular cartilage. So the structure of the long bone is a very, very important part of the skeletal system. So make sure that you are comfortable with the structures presented on this slide. Now when we start to look at bone under the microscope, we'll find that bone has a few different types of cells. And we've got three that we're going to learn. We have osteoblasts, osteocytes, and osteoclasts. Each cell is at a different stage of life and is going to serve a different function for our bone. Osteoblasts are immature cells. These are the types of cells that are secreting bone matrix known as osteoid. Osteoid is what we often think of as bone. This is a very hardened bone matrix. Remember, bone is still considered a type of connective tissue, and connective tissue is going to be made up of cells and extracellular matrix. So the osteoblasts are going to be the cells that are secreting this bone matrix known as osteoid. Osteocytes, standing for bone cells, are more mature cells that can be found within bones. These are no longer going to be secreting bone matrix. Osteocytes instead are going to monitor and maintain bone. These can also be found dispersed through our bones as well. And we will see how osteocytes are, are found within our bones in a few slides. Osteoclasts are our last type of bone cell that we're going to need to learn about in chapter 6. Osteoclasts are a very specialized bone cell, and these do the opposite of osteoblasts. While osteoblasts secrete bone matrix and make bone, osteoclasts are going to actually break down bone, and they're going to be integral for a process known as bone remodeling. So when osteoclasts break down bones, they're going to latch on very tightly and secrete some enzymes that will help to break down bone and release calcium to the blood. So bone remodeling is this very nice balance between osteoblastic activity and osteoclastic activity. Bone remodeling is a process that is always occurring within our bodies, and I will talk about this in a few slides as well. But these are the three types of bone cells that we have. Osteoblasts are going to make bone and secrete bone matrix. Osteocytes are going to maintain bone and make sure that everything's going all right within our bone tissue. And osteoclasts are going to break down bone. So osteoblasts actually become osteocytes, and it's interesting how they do this. As these osteoblasts are secreting bone matrix, they're secreting bone matrix all around themselves until they seal themselves within a space within the bone known as lacunae. The spaces are known as lacunae. So I've put this picture here to, to characterize how our osteoblasts are going to be. They secrete bone matrix around themselves so that they can no longer escape bone, and then they become osteocytes. So this is showing us the different types of bone cells. Osteoblasts are secreting this bone matrix. This is the hard part of our bone. And so they're secreting this bone matrix all around themselves, and they're leaving themselves within this little space known as a lacunae. So the osteoblasts are secreting this bone matrix, and eventually they're going to seal themselves into the bone. Once osteoblasts have sealed themselves into the bone, they become osteocytes and have these long, slender projections. These long slender projections that we can find on osteocytes are going to allow osteocytes to squeeze those projections through different channels that can be found in the bone and talk to one another. 
Those channels can help osteocytes link up with other osteocytes, and we can have a nice network of cells coursing through our bone. Osteoclasts are going to be actually a few cells that have fused together, and they'll have this, this little ruffled border. This is the end that attaches to bone, and when it, when it attaches to bone, it functions like a suction cup. It's going to really attach very tightly, and then it's going to secrete digestive enzymes to break down bone, and that will release calcium into our bloodstream. So I've got a really nice way to remember the different functions of osteoblasts, osteocytes, and osteoclasts. Osteoblasts, with a B, will build bone. They build up bone. Blast cells are immature cells, and they will typically secrete the matrix of connective tissue. Osteocytes refer to bone cells, and these are going to be monitoring that bone tissue. Osteoclasts are going to crush or break down bone. And so each of these letters and, and words in here will indicate what our bone cells do. So this slide is just repeating a lot of the things that I've already said. Compact bone is going to be found on the outside of our bones, and spongy bone will be found in the middle. Bone is a very, very heavy material, so we have to have spongy bone in the center because it's a lot more lightweight than compact bone. Compact bone is, is a lot heavier, which allows it to serve a better protective function. Spongy bone is made up of spicules known as trabeculae. Those are these irregular growths that make up our spongy bone. These different parts of bone are just randomly connecting with each other and forming different bridges between the spongy bone trabeculae spicules. And as I mentioned, with the structure of our long bones, we can find red bone marrow that's housed within the spaces between these trabeculae. Now these are structurally two different types of bones, and we will see under the microscope that they are actually very, very different from one another. So the next few slides will cover the histology of compact and spongy bone. We're going to see what these look like under the microscope and how these are structurally different. So the structure of each of these different types of bones offers the function of that type of bone as well. So let's look here at compact bone and the different structures that we can see under the microscope. So our structural unit of compact bone is what is known as the osteon, and we can also call this a haversion system. Osteons are very, very long, cylindrically shaped structures that can be found within compact bone. These are just very, very long cylinders that can be found within other cylinders. So compact bone is made up of a bunch of different osteons, and each osteon is going to have some of its own parts. In the center of every osteon, we will find a space known as the central canal. And this is a space that allows for blood vessels and nerves to course through our bone. Remember how I mentioned that nervous tissue and epithelial tissue can be found within our bone. And bone has a very, very rich blood supply. So the central canal is allowing for these blood vessels and such to course through our bones. And you can actually see how we have these, these different vessels coming here, and then they're going to actually be attaching to each other, and they form this really, this really intricate network of blood vessels inside of our bones. Now within our osteon, we'll also have lamellae. Lamellae are just the actual bone matrix. And these are the cylinders that form our osteon. So the lamellae are these matrix tubes that are wrapping around the central canal. And there's various layers of these, of these different lamellae. I actually like to use this slide to explain lamellae. They are these matrix tubes that are found here. So we're looking at the top of the osteon. And we can see that there's different tubes of bone matrix that are, that are found on the outside, and then this one's going to be found on the, on the inside of that outer one, and then we have this one, and so forth. And all of these tubes are just tubes within other tubes. You can see nicely here that we have these different layers of lamellae that can be found making up the osteon. So the lamellae are the actual bone matrix that wrap around the central canal and give the osteon some physical structure. Again, the lamellae are the bone matrix themselves, so this osteoid is what is actually making up the, the hard part of the osteon. One of the other parts to our osteon are the osteocytes. The osteocytes can be found in little spaces between the lamellae known as lacuna. The little space that our osteoblast left for itself when it was secreting bone matrix and then it became an osteocyte, that is the lacuna. So this little picture up here shows this nicely. We have an osteocyte, which has these very long and slender projections. And this osteocyte is going to be sitting in a little space known as lacuna. And on either side, you can see the lamellae. Now there's one other structure, these little canals that can be found here. And those are going to be linking the different lacunae that contain different osteocytes. 
So these long slender projections from one osteocyte are going to reach out through canaliculi to other bone cells. And this is what allows our osteocytes to link up and monitor our bone's homeostasis. Spongy bone actually has a very similar structure to compact bone. However, we don't see a central canal and we don't necessarily call these osteon. But we will see these different layers of bone matrix known as lamellae. You can see these nicely presented in this picture. There's a few different layers of lamellae. And coursing through the lamellae are these little tubes known as canaliculi, these little tubes that allow for, for our osteocytes to link up. You can see that, that this osteocyte might pr project, it's one of its, uh, one of its slender projections out here to this osteocyte. And they're going to be able to come together and, and, and monitor bone together, and they're all going to work together. And those osteocytes will still be found in these little spaces known as lacunae, but we'll also have a lot of osteoblasts around the outside making new bone, and we'll have osteoclasts that are breaking down bone. This picture nicely shows the spongy bone trabeculae, which is just spongy bone, um, and there's also the space that can be found within the spongy bone, which is where our red bone marrow is going to be found. So while spongy bone is different from compact bone, they're actually fairly similar. They have a lot of similar elements. We just wouldn't necessarily call this an osteon, and we don't see a central canal. Now the central canal of our haversion system and the spaces between the trabeculae will also allow for blood vessels to course through our bone and create this blood vessel network. This picture nicely shows how the central canals of different osteon actually will connect to each other. And this gives us a very, very intricate blood supply. So long bones especially are going to have a lot of blood supply. We'll have periosteal arteries that will enter the bone through the diaphysis. And we'll have a nutrient artery that's entering into the center of the diaphysis. And we'll have other vessels that enter the bone through the epiphysis. So this picture is nice to just show you how intricate the blood supply is of bone. Bone has an extremely rich blood supply, and this is where we see the epithelial tissue that can be found within our bones. So up in the epiphysis, we'll have the epiphyseal artery and veins. These are going to be coursing through the epiphysis. We'll have the metaphyseal artery and veins. Those will be entering through the metaphysis. And then we'll have the nutrient artery and veins, as well as the periosteal artery and veins that will enter through the diaphysis. The nutrient artery and vein are going to enter through the center of every diaphysis, and this is going to be the major blood vessel that's found supplying our bones. So while this is not actually showing us, uh, showing the nutrient artery entering through the center of the diaphysis, in other pictures you will see that this is going to be more appropriately located. So that will take us into bone formation. Bone formation, of course, refers to the process by which our bodies will make new bones. And there are many times throughout life where we need to form new bones. So of course, during fetal development, when we are growing and have to make new bones in order to have bones in the first place, um, bones are constantly going to be growing. I mentioned the epiphyseal plate and how we're constantly adding bones and elongating our bones. And that occurs at the epiphyseal plate. So bone formation also takes place during adolescence as well as in fetal growth. But once we reach adulthood, there are still other times when our bodies are going to need to undergo some type of bone formation. So for example, when fractures occur, when fractures occur, we need to grow more bone around the area of fracture. We need to repair the bone that can be found in that region. And the most common type is bone remodeling. So, so bones are always remodeling. There is always bone remodeling taking place within our bodies. And so bone remodeling, again, is referring to the balance between osteoblastic activity and osteoclastic activity. So every day we see bone formation taking place in our body due to bone remodeling. This is a very, very important concept. And again, I will go over this in a future slide. So there are two types of bone formation endochondral ossification, and intramembranous ossification. Endochondral ossification we will see occur in long bones, and intramembranous ossification we will see occur in flat bones. Now we haven't quite talked very much about flat bones yet, but some of the flat bones that we find within our body are the ribs and the bones of the cranium. Those are flat bones, and they tend to, of course, appear rather flat. So I want you guys to be focusing on how intramembranous ossification and endochondral ossification differ. So we'll start with intramembranous ossification. Intramembranous ossification occurs in flat bones, while endochondral ossification will occur in long bones. So this type is how flat bones form. 
So there's a few steps to intermembranous ossification. And the first step is the development of the ossification center. Now there's going to be a lot of these ossification centers found together and they're going to eventually meet up and that's what forms our spongy bone trabeculae. And an ossification center will start with osteoblasts. Remember, osteoblasts secrete bone matrix. So the osteoblasts are going to come together, they're going to form this little, this little localized region and start secreting bone matrix. And eventually that's going to take us into the second step, which is calcification. This refers to the hardening of our ossification center. So bone is actually gaining its, its major characteristic here. It's becoming very hard with calcification. Calcium and some other minerals are actually what make bone very hard and firm. So calcification refers to the hardening of bones. Now as these ossification centers grow, they're going to branch out, and eventually they will meet with each other, which is what forms the trabeculae of our spongy bone. So you can imagine how, how, these, how these different ossification centers are going to irregularly grow. You, you know, we might have had one right here, we might have had one here, and they're going to just sort of grow and branch out until they form different bridges. And the last step of intramembranous ossification is developing the periosteum. So there's also going to be a periosteum found in our flat bones that's going to be wrapping around our bones as well. So you can find this process discussed on page 178 and 179 of your book. I do suggest that you give these a read. But again, with bone formation, we want to understand how this type is going to differ with endochondral ossification. So on this slide, we see endochondral ossification laid out. And there are some major differences between intramembranous ossification and endochondral ossification. So let's discuss those differences. Intramembranous ossification started with an ossification center, and it eventually formed trabeculae. And intramembranous ossification is how we form flat bones, and only flat bones. Endochondral ossification, more specifically, is going to be how our long bones occur. And there are some notable characteristics about endochondral ossification as well. So let's go through these steps. First and foremost is we have the development of a cartilage model. We're going to actually use a model of hyaline cartilage to start off endochondral ossification. This is one of the major differences that we see between intramembranous and endochondral ossification. Endochondral ossification will always start with this cartilage precursor model. So instead of having osteoblasts kick this whole process off, we actually have chondroblasts, which are immature cartilage cells. So these are going to start making this model, and these are going to continue to grow and grow and grow until we eventually form a primary ossification center. This is the ossification center that started by the nutrient artery in the diaphysis of our long bones. So that nutrient artery penetration is what allows for this primary ossification to really form. Osteoclasts found within this space are going to form the medullary cavity. Remember, the osteoclasts break down bone, so they're actually hollowing out this center portion of our long bones. And that's what's forming this nice space, which we will later use to contain yellow bone marrow. Now, with long bones, we have a diaphysis, but we also have epiphyses. So this is then going to lead us to the development of the secondary ossification center. So the epiphyseal arteries are going to penetrate into the epiphysis, and that's where we find the secondary ossification center. So the primary ossification center is found within the diaphysis, while the secondary ossification center starts up here in the epiphysis. This is another major difference between endochondral ossification and intramembranous ossification. Intramembranous ossification just had an ossification center, while endochondral ossification has both a primary ossification center and a secondary ossification center. You can then see we're going to add the finishing touches where we add this layer of articular cartilage on the outside of our epiphysis, as well as form the epiphyseal growth plate. So in summary, endochondral ossification occurs in long bones and has a primary and a secondary ossification center while intramembranous ossification occurs in flat bones and only has an ossification center. There's just one in intramembranous ossification. So endochondral ossification occurs throughout growth. As we grow and our bones get longer, we're adding bone matrix to this epiphyseal plate. And there's a lot of other zones in here, and we could really break down this process, but I don't, I don't want you guys to focus too much on all these different zones in here. I just want you to understand the difference between endochondral and intramembranous ossification.
But this slide is useful to show us that endochondral ossification occurs throughout our adolescence, and as we grow, we are undergoing endochondral ossification and adding new bone matrix to the epiphyseal plate. And eventually, that is what elongates our bones. You can see that as we form new bone, we're going to end up fusing this bone matrix together and, and eventually forming what's known as the osteon. So that's what this, this picture is nice to show us, is that bone is going to grow around our blood vessels, and that's going to make a space for the blood vessels, and eventually these will be the osteons that we see. Now as we age and as we get older, bone is not only going to elongate, but it will also thicken. And this is due to the cooperative action of both osteoblasts and osteoclasts together. So you can see that in the infant, the bone is going to be a lot, a lot smaller. And as we grow and grow and grow to the adult size, bone gets a lot larger and has a much greater diameter. So the way that this works is that in the infant we're going to have this we're going to have this small bone and as we grow osteoblasts on the outside of our bones are going to constantly add new bone matrix. However, osteoclasts on the inside of our bones are going to destroy and remove that bone matrix. So this produces a progression of thickening in our long bones as well. You can see that these osteoclasts are going to break down this inner layer while osteoblasts are forming this outer layer. And so we're going to progressively get thicker and thicker and thicker. And again, you can see in the young adult, osteoclasts are going to continue breaking down this center portion and eventually the osteoblasts are going to build up this outer portion until we eventually have a much larger medullary cavity. So osteoblasts and osteoclasts work together in order to allow for this bone thickening to occur. And that's going to be one of the trends that we will often see within the skeletal system. Osteoblasts and osteoclasts are often working together, and that is going to maintain bone's homeostasis.